Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. A warm welcome to our members, brokers, and colleagues who are joining our webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Suzanne. I'm the Head of Claims at the West of England, and I'm here to introduce you to our speakers who are going to give you an introduction, an overview of the new regulations that are aimed at reducing carbon emissions from ships. We are focusing on two measures today, both effective as of January 2023. The first is the Energy Efficiency Existing Ship Index, or the EEXI. This is a rating system that analyzes the energy performance of existing ships based on data and other input regarding their energy consumption. The second measure is the Carbon Intensity Indicator Rating Scheme, or the CII. This scheme is used to monitor and rank the efficiency of the vessel. Nicola Cox, our Head of Defence, and Julian Rabot, our Head of Claims in Singapore, will take you through the legal implications of EEXI and CII, looking at charter party obligations and various aspects arising under the BINCO clauses. But to begin with, let me introduce Simon Hodgkinson, our Global Head of Loss Prevention, who will take you through the technical aspects of the two schemes. If we have time at the end, we'll take questions. But if we don't have time, then please email any of us on the panel with your questions at a later stage. For now, Simon, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background to the EEXI or EXI the Energy Efficiency Existing Ship Index, and then the CII. So the EXI, it enters for, entered force in January this year, and it is an extension of the EEDI, which came into uh, existence in 2012 and applied to all of the new buildings from 2013 onwards. It is a one-off, pass or fail, paper test and it is completed after at the first annual survey or first special survey after the 1st of January this year and it will apply to all the existing vessels over 400 gross tons and it is a technical measure and the aim is to improve the energy efficiency of the existing designs of vessels. Next slide, please. Right, so there's sort of two parts to it. So the first part is the attained EXI, and this is the current actual estimate of the energy, efficience, energy efficiency, and it's calculated by using the technical guidelines of the equipment and the design of the vessel. And then you have the required EXI, and that's the maximum for, uh, permitted value of the vessel's attained EXI, and it's use of, it uses a formula based on vessel's type and vessel size. And then fairly obviously, if the attained number is greater than the required number, then there are some technical modifications required to get the required number lower. Sorry, the attained number lower. Next slide, please. So that there are some suggestions, and this is ones that everybody has been talking about over the last period of time. Probably the most common suggestion for a technical modification to reduce the level is EPL or engine power limitation. Another option if you're diesel electric, for example, would be a shaft power reduction. Simplistically, all that means is you limit the power on the engine, therefore limiting the emissions. There will always be an override function on this because SOLAS will always come in and that will allow you to return in an emergency for safety of life at sea, pollution, etc., to the original power to make sure that you keep out of danger on the lee shore, for example. 
Then there are some more significant options. You can alter the bow area, so improving the bulbous bow, changing the hydrodynamics around the bow area. There are multiple different options you see of vessel shapes nowadays. And then down at the propeller, looking, um, you could add a quart nozzle, you can add hydrodynamics to improve the water flow past the propeller blades, you can change the propeller blades. You can add energy saving devices on board the vessel. Very simple one, LED lights, probably already fitted to most vessels. You could have power limit, uh, variable power limitation on your pumps to reduce the power load to the pumps when the pumps aren't working hard. Alternative fuels, probably a bit trickier to fit to a standard vessel than these more and more alterations are required to allow you to use the alternative fuels, maybe you know, a tank for LNG and then power and fittings. So it's not simple. And then you go the whole hog and you can go to the next level of invasive energy efficient technology, which could include changing the engine of the vessel that might not be a practical option. Um, just briefly, so your EXI technical file has to be approved by flag state or class, and that is done during the IAPP service or the air pollution certificate survey, which takes place after January 1st this year, and then that is added to your energy efficiency certificate. Next slide, please. Now we quick move on to the carbon intensity indicator, CII. Next, thank you. Um, it's an operational tool to measure the carbon intensity generated during the operations of the vessels over a year's period. It will apply to all vessels over 5,000 gross tonnes, and each vessel is then given an annual carbon intensity rating. Very similar to almost all of you on the side of your new fridge when you bought it or dishwasher, you'll have had an A to E efficiency rating. So it's very similar to that. A being the best, E being urgent work action is needed to make the improvements, and C is the baseline that you're aiming for as a minimum. And it must be emphasized this is specific to the individual vessel so it is not all vessels of one class it is not the fleet of vessels that you possess it is each individual vessel will have its own rating next slide please so you have an attained cii and a required cii so the required cii is the annual operating efficiency, and it's a predetermined with a predetermined reduction factor, which reduces annually, and it becomes increasingly more stringent towards the target date of 2030. The ship must calculate the required CII as the target value of the attained CII for the vessel. The attained CII, the vessel's actual operational efficiency is very much dependent on how you operate it through the year's period, how long you spend in port, if the vessel is laid up, how much time is spent at sea. The data is then collected through a document system for fuel oil consumption for vessels, and then that is documented and you verify against the required CII for that vessel. Next slide, please. So, very simple formula. Your annual efficiency rating, AER, is your CO2 emissions, and that is the emissions created, well, is calculated from the fuel that you consume during the 12 month period. And that is the volume of fuel, the quality of fuel, and the type of fuel you burn. You then divide that by the dead weight of the ship. And now the dead weight is the summer load line dead weight. And you multiply that by the distance sailed over the year. Now, at the moment, people are not considered to be cargo. So cruise ships, Roro cargo ships, and Roro passenger ships have a slightly different calculation. 
And the difference is rather than dead weight, we use the gross tonnage of the vessel multiplied by the distance sailed. Next slide, please. Right, some operational considerations. The attained CII is calculated used by using the emissions from the fuel consumed. Emissions vary on the trade, distance traveled, length of port stays, the speed the vessels travels, the performance of the vessel, the weather the vessel goes through. And to be very clear, we just sort of a recent study they was conducted on two sister vessels. One was on a long-term charter and one was operating on the spot market. The vessel on a long-term charter over the period of 12 months managed to attain a CII rating of B. However, the vessel on the spot market, which is identical to the other vessel, was definitely a good performer when it was moving cargo, but it spent a lot of time at anchor or in port consuming fuel, waiting for its next fix, next piece of business, and the idle time causes the CII to suffer because you're not create, you're not doing any mileage, so the distance doesn't go up, but you're still consuming fuel on your auxiliaries as you stand by for operations. No, accumula no accumulation of miles. This has a big negative impact on the vessel, pardon me, which then resulted in a poor CII rating, and I think the rating actually turned out to be D. Uh, next slide, please. So, an implementation plan must be developed as part of the approved Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plan, yeah, another acronym, the SEMP. The SEMP is to document for each vessel how the required annual operational CIO will be achieved over the next three years. And within the document, it must set out the methodology that's going to be used to mon monitor and then calculate the attained CII, the annual required operational target for the three years, and an implementation plan to achieve this target, and the procedure on how the vessel stroke company is going to evaluate and then make improvements on the basis with the CII we're supposed to be moving from this base in 2023 to a much lower level by 2030. 40% improvement. Next slide, please. So what happens? At the end of the year, within three months of the end of the calendar year, so at the end of 2023, you've got March, January, February, and March 2024 to report the attained value to flag state that you attained in 2023. That will then determine the rating for 2024 A to E for that year. The minimum compliant rating is C, so you're aiming to get C or better. If the vessel gets a D rating for three consecutive years or one E rating, then you are required to show a plan of corrective actions in the SEMP. Next slide, please. So are there ways to improve your annual, annual efficiency rating? Well, it's important to monitor in real time. So if you only actually do the calculations at the end of the year, you don't know how the vessel was operated. If you operate it in real time, there may be some possibilities that will give you options to improve it. If you have a poor start to the year, to make some improvements through the year. Operational adjustments could include reducing speed and slow steaming, i.e. reducing the power on the engine, therefore reducing the amount of fuel you burn, therefore reducing the amount of CO2 you release to the atmosphere. You could reduce the cargo volume on some vessels. If you reduce the volume that you transport, you will use, it require less power on the engines to move the vessel through the water. 
you could increase the distance sail deviating from unfavorable weather include ballast voyages for the longer distance you could if you would also look at your voyage length and try and might find the most efficient speed for the length rather than steam really quickly arrive off the port and wait which would then affect your rating you can then look at installing more energy energy saving equipment and more improvements to the hydrodynamics of the vessel is a possibility the viability of options depend on you know obviously the design of the vessel the type of the vessel the trade the vessels on and including the terms of your charter party next slide please so with that i shall pass on to much cleverer people than me so i shall pass you on to julian for the contractual implications thank you julian all yours hello and good evening from singapore uh, so just as a reminder, EEXI is related to the technical design of the ship and measures the efficiency of the ship. So turning to bare boat charters, um, the main responsibility for complying with the regulations rests with the charters, um, as they have the obligation to keep uh, the ship in class and keep all necessary uh, certificates um, in force and up to date. Uh, they also are responsible with the maintenance um, of the ship. Um, it's only in a rare situation that you need the ship owner's approval for example, when uh, the charter wants to make structural and substantial changes to the ship. Obviously, this may then lead to disagreements uh, with the owner. Uh, next slide. Now, um, big, biggest difficulties may arise with um, time charter parties. So the, the frameworks with time charter parties is as follows. Uh, the charter directs the use and employment of the ship. The master is obliged to follow the charter's legitimate and lawful orders. The charter's orders must be executed promptly and owners um, must have a seaworthy ship. Uh, next slide. So basically the compliance rests with the owners. And for example, if um, the ship is going to do some substantial uh, changes and modifications to the ship, the ship may want to, to dry dock or deviate and carry out the modifications. Now, if there is no clause in a charter party to do so, um, and, you know, for example, to, to liberty to dry dock at any moment, um, owners will be in breach. Um, of course, any time and cost um, for the modifications taken from the modification will be for um, owners account. Um, once modifications um, are conducted, uh, this will have implications as well on owners uh, obligations because the ship may go slower for example if there's some um, epl engine power limitation or sharp only, sharp power limitation um, and owners may be then in breach of, of their warranties in the charter part so um, in view of this uh, binko came out with a clause last year um, on uh, eexi and uh, my colleague uh, nicola uh, will talk to you about it mm. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Uh, yes, apologies for the background. I, my opposite neighbours decided to do some chainsawing. I did actually ask them if perhaps it could be quiet for half an hour. It didn't work. So my communication perhaps might not be very good, but hopefully my communication here will be clear enough. Um, so as uh, Julian has said, the an unamended time charter uh, is not uh, suitable at all uh, for dealing with the IMO uh, and the EXI modifications uh, the vessels might be needing. Uh, and that's why it's incredibly important uh, for um, operators and owners to include some sort of a clause to uh, incorporate what the vessels and uh, owners are going to need to do for these regulations. So the BIMCO uh, has published a clause on EXI, which was published in December 2021. Um, and I'll just briefly go through these uh, with you and perhaps flag up a few uh, perhaps uh, difficulties or areas of um, concern potentially. So firstly, um, the context of the clause, and this sets out the groundwork really for the whole clause, uh, is the parties acknowledge and accept that the vessel is required to comply with the regulations from the effective date, which will be from 1st of January this year, and that this uh, may require EXI modifications. 
And secondly, that if modifications are required, these should be completed by owners prior to the effective date. So this is actually the same wording also as the CII clause that uh, BIMCO has published and that uh, Julian and I will be speaking about in a little bit. Um, so this incorporates an acknowledgement and agreement by parties, both parties, that uh, modifications may be needed. And this is why, even though it sounds a fairly plain vanilla clause, it is the, the crux of making sure that owners are able to do the modifications um, in, in compliance uh, with the regulations. However, having said that, the BIMCO clause is specific, limited in scope. So it says that it only deals with engine power limitation and shaft power limitation. Uh, in other cases, it says that the modifications shall be subject to charters prior agreement and approval, which will not be unreasonably withheld or delayed by the charters. Next slide, please. So turning to the, so the meat of the clause, so set the scene with the clause and, and the agreement and understanding uh, between the parties. And then I'm just going to go through some of the clauses, the meat of the EXI clause. So starting off with the division of responsibilities, as you'd expect, the specification of the modifications and the new speed and consumption uh, is determined uh, by owners. Uh, and, and equally, so that applies both for specification and also the consumption and speed warranties afterwards. So it's a, it's a twofold um, obligation on owners. But then we come on to planning for the modifications, so where the ship may be will be taken out of service. And there it's more of a, um, a, a, a party of two, as it were, the owners and charterers are involved. So first of all, um, owners have an obligation to inform charters in writing about the modifications without undue delay, and the owners shall use their reasonable endeavours to plan and effect the modifications during the service without any loss of time to charters. Uh, and, but equally, so that's a sort of, it's a, a quid pro quo, owners and charters inform each other, uh, and owners have the obligation to minimise disruption, but at the end of the day, the owners have the right to take the vessel out of service to effect modification. So if there can't be an agreement or cooperation, then owners' rights trump over the charter's rights. Having said that, the BIMCO guidance notes, interestingly, um, anticipates there'll be only minimal disruption, uh, in, in the BIMCO's words, um, by taking the vessel out of service. Um, but I, I guess we shall see. And I'll certainly later on, I'll be asking perhaps audience members what their experience has been with uh, installing modifications and any disruption to charter parties. Next slide, please. So carrying on um, with the planning of the modifications. Um, so it says that owners shall give at least three weeks written notice for anticipated time frame and location of the modifications. Um, and upon request, the charter should provide an itinerary for the vessel and update the owners in case of changes. So this touches on the nub of it. There tries to be cooperation. Owners have a duty to obligation to install the modifications, but the clause specifically encourages uh, the parties to give information to each other to try and make this process as seamless as possible. And then responsibility, cost, and time frame, as you'd expect, this is for the owners. So the owners obviously have to pay for it, they have to specify it, and they're responsible for, for, for the procurement, the purchase, payment, installation, and trials. Uh, and then it says any actual time, loss of time to the vessel, including bunkers, uh, should be for the owner's account. So, so far, so normal as you would expect. Some questions I've got that have occurred to me as I read this clause is what happens if owners give less than three weeks written notice uh, and charterers uh, therefore, at very short notice, have to alter their voyage plans to allow the vessel owners to take their vessel out. If owners were to give one week's written notice or three weeks non-written notice, does that mean charters could refuse and say, no, these are our voyage orders, we're not allowing this, you must uh, reserve a, a three weeks written notice? Probably, um, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, and or the parties come, could come to an agreement. I mean, in theory, if it wasn't a proper notice, charters could refuse, but owners' rights trump, or perhaps charters could claim a right in damages if their voyage is disrupted and they suffer a loss of profit. Um, the other thing is what happens if the shipyard schedule changes? So owners give three week, at least three weeks written notice, uh, but then the yard can't take the vessel for another two weeks. 
you know, what happens there? I mean, hopefully the parties will come to an agreement. They'll keep the communication channels open, um, but I can see uh, potentially some difficulties there. Um, and then what happens if the charter is refused? Owners rights trump, so therefore owners can, will take the vessel out of service. Um, but the other thing is what happens if modifications are done, but they're not sufficient, they're not done well enough, or they need more modifications. The clause seems to anticipate only one uh, period of time out of charter to do the modifications. But don't forget the, the, the beginning of the clause itself says the parties acknowledge and accept the vessel is required to comply with the EXI regulations. So if modifications are done and it doesn't enable the vessel to comply, does that mean that impliedly charters have to agree a second uh, visit to the dry dock? It, it's not clear. And the other thing to bear in mind is that there's no automatic uh, extension. It doesn't count as an off-hire period, although the time and bunkers during the modification is for owners to count. The clause doesn't say it would be deemed to be off-hire. So if the charter party allows charters to add off hire periods to the end of the charter, the period in dry dock, it seems to me, wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't count as, a, as, a, as an extra off hire period. So charters couldn't, uh, with, without agreement, add on uh, a, an extra period of charter. Uh, next slide, please. So now we go on to when the modifications have been made um, to the vessel. And there the clause says, as soon as reasonably possible, as reasonably possible following the implementation, owners will notify charters in writing of the new maximum speed and corresponding consumption figures and other consequential changes to the vessel, vessel description. And it also says the new maximum speed and corresponding consumption figures shall replace the existing warranted figures. So this is if the new post modification um, warranties are, are lower. So it can go to a lower speed uh, with a lower consumption. So note here that uh, charters are not, charters are simply told, the owners tell the charters, they notify the charters afterwards what the consumption and what and speed uh, warranties shall be. So there's no provision in the clause for the parties to have, or for charters to have any, any information beforehand. And it seems to me that presumably before a vessel, an owner takes his vessel to the yard for EXI modifications, he will have some uh, forward knowledge uh, and planning um, about what sort of speed and consumption the vessel's likely to achieve after the modification. And it might be if parties want to have a, uh, include the BIMCO clause, they might want to add um, something to the effect that on delivery, for example, or again, the three weeks notice uh, prior to the modification, that owners shall give, perhaps without guarantee, uh, what the likely performance uh, parameters of a vessel is going to be after the modification. Again, so that charters can plan their future uh, voyages for the period after modifications. The clause also says that other consequential changes to the vessel description should be logically amended. Uh, I'm not sure what the other consequential changes which are logically amended, what these might be. It could be uh, perhaps cargo carrying capacity. It could be perhaps, uh, um, I don't know, extra maintenance obligations. Again, this is very much left um, for the parties to work out uh, whilst the, the, the time charter goes on. Um, and the, the BIMCO guidance notes uh, refers to the speed warranty and the consumption warranty. It doesn't give much guidance about what other logical amendments um, it, they have in mind. Uh, it also says that the, the clause, any reduction in the speed and consumption shall be within the vessel's performance curve derived from the charter party's warranted figures. Again, the vessel's performance curve is not, I think, something, it's not something I'm aware of. I'm a, I don't think it's a term of art that I've seen, in, for example, in case law. Perhaps uh, it's in the IMO regulations. Um, I'm not sure, but this may be an area, that, again, that will be fleshed out as parties experience um, the regulations in practice. And then, as you'd expect, um, to make the, make sense of the clause, it says charters shall not order the vessel to prosecute voyages at a speed which it would exceed the new maximum speed. So again, that's putting in place the fact that the new speed and consumption is like written into the charter um, after the modifications. So that's the end of what I'm going to be talking about on the CII, the EXI clause. And now uh, my colleague Julian will go on um, to discuss the CII 
uh, regulations. So over to you, Julian. Julian, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, just a reminder, CII, is, uh, CII rating is the calculation of CO2 emissions emitted per mile sailed. So turning to sanctions and enforcement, uh, for the moment, there's, apart from the corrective plan uh, in the SEMP for ships with a D and E uh, rating, uh, there's no clear sanctions uh, regime yet. However, the uh, regulatory landscape is likely to evolve and there's a potential uh, IMA guidelines on sanctions. Um, this is still to come. There may also be some incentives uh, on vessels which have a rating of A and B. And it's unclear, but it's a possibility that there may be some withdrawal of technical documents so by flag and class if the rating is consistently low. Next page. So um, commercially, uh, there may be some um, requirements in the contracts and the charter parties to have a minimum rating by the charters. There may also be some uh, ports, which will only allow ships with a rating of C and above uh, to call to, to call to their port. Um, it might be also dictated by you know, customer demand. You know, um, certain charters, certain big charters may only require uh, ships rated A or B. And maybe charter rates uh, corresponding to the CI rating um, will, will appear. So a ship with an A rated um, uh, CI rating um, will possibly uh, command a higher higher than um, a ship rated C. And more importantly, maybe on the finance, um, banks uh, will not provide uh, finance to a ship owner um, and his fleet if a ship or maybe the average of the fleet um, CI rating is too low. So next paper. So now turning to contractual implications. Uh, next page. So um, really it's with uh, time charters, compliance with uh, CI obligation is likely to be very uh, challenging. You know, uh, EXI compliance is very different from uh, CI compliance. EXI is a parcel fail test and it will be done this year and after that we won't have to hear about it. CI uh, compliance and, and the rating, you know, your rating is only as good as your last year's performance and it will be very difficult to accurately predict the operational CII uh, for a three year period in advance um, in accordance to the reduction factor. And one thing to, you know, to remind yourself is the attained CI factor is likely to be outside of owner's immediate control as it's really subject to external factors such as bad weather, extended port stay, for example, in a port that has a lot of congestion, you know, the route chosen by the charters and just generally following charters orders. Um, so it will be very hard for, very challenging for the owner to monitor and assess in real time um, its rating and try to take steps to comply with the CI regulations. It will also be very hard actually to calculate carbon emissions during a period of the charter as it might be important um, on redelivery as the charter may um, be bound to redeliver the ship with a minimum CI rating and maybe owners um, on the following charter may have warranted a uh, minimum char uh, CI rating as well. So next page. So there's basically a, a bit of a conflict between the preventative steps members can take in order to improve their rating and owners' general obligations under a time chart part. So the preventative steps are reducing speed, possibly deviating from the quickest route in order to avoid bad weather and higher consumption, and even maybe to the extreme, reducing cargo intake, intake. And this will directly conflict with the obligations of due dispatch, you know, following charters obligations, uh, instructions, speed and, co speed and consumption warranties, the fact that you're not supposed to deviate in a time charter party, uh, cargo capacity warranties will be impacted, and this may lead to off-hire damages and maybe termination of charter party. So 
And, and lastly, and I know that doesn't really relate to time travel parties, but there may be some implications um, with regards to bills of lading where um, receivers uh, may bring a claim for breach of due dispatch obligations and even some cargoes that are time sensitive, such as uh, soybeans, which deteriorate after 30 days. Um, that may increase the number of claims. And we, we already have quite a lot of you know, frequent claims for soybean between Brazil uh, and uh, China because you know the, the voyage is very close to 30 days. And if the ship reduces speed, this may actually increase possibilities of uh, cargo claims. Next step. So if in a time charter party there's no clause dealing with CI, then owners may have to turn to implied terms. And um, for example, if an owner refuses to follow charter's orders um, because he doesn't want his CII uh, to be um, impacted, um, it will be very hard to, to, to argue as, um, an implied term because the owner will have to show a causal link between the charter's orders, the regulations breached and the losses. And in particular, if we're talking about a trick time charter or very short time charter, it'd be very hard because the charter might say, well, actually, how can you pinpoint that my orders um, led to your downgrading when, when you've been um, chartering the ship to other, other charters during the year? And similarly, if um, the owners follow charter's orders, but um, uh, as a result, they get downgraded to D or E, um, they may not be able to claim damages against the charters because again, it will be hard to establish a link between charter's orders and the breach of regulations and your losses. Um, the impact not, might not also be uh, limited to owners, but maybe for charters who um, may say that it is implied term that the, sh that the ship owner has to deliver um, a ship um, with a rating of C or above as it might impact a commercial rep reputation. So again, these are things to think about when uh, drafting uh, a charter party and uh, may, not, may, may not be dealt with without any, any specific clause. Next page. So now turning to voyage charter parties and COAs, the, si the situation is probably a little bit easier because owners retain far more control on the op daily operations of the ship. However, there will still be some um, issues if there's no tailored clause um, dealing, um, dealing with CI uh, regulations. So again, if the owner reduces speed, he may be in, he may be in breach of uh, the due dispatch obligations or you know, speed and consumption warranties, if any are given in a, in a voyage charter party. Again, if the owner reduces cargo capacity, this May and it may be a breach of cargo capacity warranties in the charter party. It may also lead to um, slowing down, may lead to late time in the marriage issues. Um, so, I mean, one solution, at least for when owners want to be able to reduce speed, is to use the Binco Slow Steaming Clause of 2012. But that this would only uh, deal with the issue of slow steaming and nothing else. Uh, when it comes to COAs, um, uh, slow steaming uh, would extend the voyage length and could reduce the total without, uh, annual amount of, voy of voyages. Similarly, you know, reducing cargo intake might not be a solution. Um, there may be very, very limited arguing, uh, arguments justifying taking any preventative action. Next page. So what should you think about when drafting um, a clause dealing with uh, CI regulations. Well, you'll want a clause that really uh, ask both parties to cooperate as, you know, owners have a duty to maintain the ship, that's sure, but, you know, he is subject to the orders of the charter and his rating will really depend on how the charter uses the ship. Um, and so you want a cooperation with the charters that are to employ the vessel uh, to enable compliance with CI regulations. Um, you also want to agree and attain CII um, that doesn't exceed uh, an agreed CII uh, rating in advance um, on redelivery. 
you'll want uh, the owners to you know uh, maintain the vessel and use all navigational aids provided by charters in particular when drafting the passage plan um, and owners will need to provide charter with, with charters with day-to-day -day and you know accurate data every day so that charters can actually cooperate and give proper um, voyage instructions next next page so owners may want the clause um, enabling them to uh, claim damages if, for example um, on redelivery the, the ship has a lower rating uh, than agreed uh, or at least lower rating than on delivery um, owners may also insist that charters um, supply bunkers with a certain calorific content You'll also want a method, maybe agree a method in advance on how to uh, calculate the CI, in particular, if the ship, uh, if the charter party is uh, shorter than a year, you'll have to calculate a certain way as to how, how you agree what CI rating you will uh, redeliver the ship as a charter. There may be some clauses with variable hire, depending on the CI rating. So, Maybe if the charter, charter uses the ship in a way that downgrades uh, the CI rating, uh, he proportionally ends up paying more higher. And conversely, if he uh, uses the ship that increases the rating, then um, the, the higher may, may decrease. Who knows? That, that could be a possibility. And lastly, maybe charters will also want to have a, a right to reject the ship if the ship on delivery is delivered with a lower uh, CI rating than, um, than warranted, a little bit similar to uh, certain right ship clauses. So because of this, uh, Binko uh, came out with um, a, a clause on CI and my colleague um, Nicola will go through this clause with you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Julian. So yes, as, as, as Julian has said, uh, so he's dealt very much with the principles behind uh, the CII clause and how this may affect uh, charter parties. And, and as he said, and as I think BIMCO themselves acknowledge, I think it's germane to the clause, it does, there is a tension between owners and charterers. So the BIMCO clause, um, I'll go through it here as to how it deals with uh, these potential tensions um, in the operating of the vessel. So the overall scheme, and this is exactly the same words as in the EEXI clause, is that both parties are to acknowledge and accept that the vessel is required to comply with the regulations. Uh, the CII clause also adds that the parties shall cooperate and work together in good faith to share findings and best practices as regards potential improvement to the vessel's efficiency and collect and share data on a daily basis that may assist the monitoring and assessment. Um, so in this regard, it, require, it does require uh, a good, a high level of coll collaboration between the parties, both when so we've had the EXI clause, uh, the collaboration before the modifications are made, and now with the CII clause throughout the charter party, because as has been stressed, the CII regulations interfere with, if you like, or, or touch on both the vessel and the operation of the vessel. So it touches on both the owners and the charter's responsibilities. So that's uh, the nature of the CII regulations require this degree of cooperation. As Julian has said, perhaps in a voyage charter, there's not quite such attention or need for collaboration because the, uh, the owners will be more in charge of what the voyage is and how many ports of call, et cetera. Um, also, the, the, the regulations require vessels to continue to improve their energy efficiency. And when preparing for the charter party, um, this is the crucial point, the parties are to agree and specify the agreed CII values. This is for the charter parties, and this is by, by calendar year or for the period of the charter if it's shorter than a year. Uh, and there's a table in the uh, BIMCO clause that sets out the ratings the parties have put, put in between 2023 and 2026, which uh, where IMO is uh, due to set out more stringent uh, requirements and targets uh, as time goes forward. So, so before delivery, uh, this is where the parties have to agree what they agree should be the charter party CII value. And if the parties don't put anything in the table, then by default, the charter party agreed CII will be the required CII, either 
i.e. what the CII efficiency rating that um, the regulations call for as a minimum for that vessel or for a C rating, a mid C rating. And so again, information is crucial. So on delivery of the charter party, the owners must give the delivery attained CII and details of bunkers and distance traveled to the charters. So basically charters don't and shouldn't inherit, uh, say the charter is halfway through 2023, um, and the vessels already had uh, a, a, a low C rating, it's not right to uh, that charters should be penalised for that. Uh, again, you want a real-time evaluation at the beginning of the charter party, where is the vessel now in terms of uh, her attained CII, and then the performance during the charter party is judged by reference to that um, benchmark on delivery. And that information needs to be given by owners to their uh, to the best of owner's knowledge, be accurate uh, and complete. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Moving to uh, during the charter party. So I'll just deal with what I do, I'll do it party by you know, chunk by chunk. So here the charter's obligations is to operate the and employ the vessel, including voyage planning and bunker fuel in a manner which is consistent to the MARPOL CII regulations. Uh, and not to, to permit the vessel's charter party attained CII to exceed the agree agreed CII by the end of each year. So this is, as I say, there's a table that the parties fill out as to what they agree will be the charter party agreed CII. Uh, and then, or if there is nothing filled out, then it's just the, the minimum needed uh, for, for, for a mid-C rating. And this is, as it were, the benchmark during the charter party as to what the target is um, during the charter party, and this may require charters to real-time calculation during the charter party how she's performing, uh, and it may require charters during the charter party to adjust their voyage orders, or employment orders, or, or even cargoes carried. Um, so it's a high burden on charters, but I can't really see a way around it because, as has been emphasised during the seminar, um, the regulations, the CIO of themselves. Um, affect both the vessel and the employment. So there has to be, I think, germane to the whole concept, there has to be this um, co collaboration and information exchange between the parties. So next slide, please. So again, now turning to owner's obligations during the charter party. So owners must comply with the SEEMP, the Ship's Energy Efficiency Management Plan, uh, provided always that charters adhere to their obligations. So again, it's two-way. The, the owners can't do it all and charters can't do it all. Owners um, must also exercise due diligence to ensure that the vessel min minimises fuel consumption. And as regards vessel maintenance, uh, maintain the vessel and her equipment rele relevant to the vessel's energy efficiency in accordance with the Charter Party and MARPOL CII regulations and the SEMP. Um, and this is ex expressly made subject to any provisions elsewhere that place maintenance obligations on the charters. And in the BIMCO guidance notes, um, they say that they they're subject to provisions elsewhere. In the charter, they have in mind, for example, hull fouling, where there's a prolonged stay in port. So where, as is usually, if there's a you know excess of 15, 30 days in port, um, charters responsible for cleaning the hull, then this clause says, well, that's that obligation stays as is. Charters should still be responsible for cleaning the hull. Um, that remains in addition to the extra obligations placed here by the CII clause. And just looking, we've had a question in from the audience, which might be best to, to deal with it as we go now. Uh, they had a question saying, for a time charterer, how do they claim for underperformance from the owners in breach of the time charter description? Can charters be held liable for compliance with the CII clause if the vessel underperforms? So here we have, we, if you're looking in the EXI clause, you had when the modifications were made, then you have the new warranties written into the charter party. So they become the new warranties the vessel must comply with. For the CII clause, here it specifically says that um, you've got maintenance obligations in the charters. Also, and I'll deal with it in a minute, there, the BIMCO clause specifically says that other warranties remain, so charters would still be able to claim for underperformance in accordance with the charter warranties, but that does not excuse charters still have to comply with CII. So you've got this slightly um, odd position, but I'll deal with it um, in a moment. And again, the clause says um, owners have to report any associated deficiencies to charters, and I'm just wondering 
perhaps I'm being too ambitious, but perhaps that does that impose an extra obligation on owners? Does this mean there's more uh, document uh, disclosure and information disclosure to charters than you would normally have in a charter party? Perhaps looking further into the future, does this in a way turn or change the landscape as far as perhaps arbitration is concerned or court litigation, where charters are already armed before any arbitration starts with more information from owners about the vessel's uh, performance than charters would normally have. So in that effect, it's front loading some of the information that otherwise charters might have to wait for um, until the disclosure stage in arbitration. Um, next slide, please. So carrying on with owner's obligations, you've got navigation and routing and owners um, have to proceed by the most fuel efficient route. So they have to adjust the vessel's trim and operate the engines, uh, make optimal use of the vessel's navigation equipment and any additional aids provided by charters, such as weather routing and voyage optimization. Uh, and charters may at their discretion provide, so that means an owner should uh, comply with, uh, orders or directions to adjust the speed or revolutions per minute to meet a specified time of arrival or to proceed at a specified main engine fuel consumption. And if charters do that, the clause specifically says that's hard baked then into the charter as charters orders and that the master then shall comply. But again, as we've seen with the EXI, at the end of the day, if push comes to shove, the master but subject always to the safety of the vessel crew, cargo and protection the environment, the vessel's engines and equipment. So again, the owners of the vessel as the, the, the asset owner have the last say if there is a dispute. Um, next slide, please. So during the charter party, the ongoing obligation to um, inform and advise, um, owners have to monitor and calculate the vessel's actual performance on a daily basis and provide charters with details of the types and quantities of fuel consume, distance traveled, and any other relevant data the charters may reasonably request for the purpose of this clause. So again, as I'm saying, it may, may well uh, give the obligation or the right on charters to ask for more information than they would, than they would they do currently without the CII clause. And again, owners, as you'd expect, undertake the data shall, uh, to the best of their knowledge, be accurate uh, and complete. So this... Um, so this is, a, is again, emphasising the information that must be ex exchanged as to how the vessel's um, performing in terms of CII rating. Next slide, please. And then what happens uh, if the rating does start to slip, the CII performance starts to, to deteriorate during the charter party? Um, what happens then? This is what the BIMCO clause describes as where the trajectory of the charter party attained CII deviates from the agreed CII, i.e. the parties have agreed a C rating, but because of how the vessel's employed or for whatever reason, she's starting to head towards a D rating. What, what happens then? And I haven't quoted the clause because it would take about two slides of text. Um, sorry, Tom, can we go back to where we were? Okay, well, um, on, on that clause, so what happens where the um, the rating slips is that the owners request in writing, and it's a bit of a ping pong match here. It's a very long clause, but it is it tries to <clears throat> it aims to hard bake the cooperation and communication. So it says the owners should request in writing. This is little clause G, and the charter should provide to the owners within two working days a written plan detailing any proposed commercial operations of the vessel for the next voyages. If upon assessment of charter's written plan, the owners can reasonably show that following this plan will result in charters failing to meet their obligations and that on the basis of the projected attained CII, i.e. where the, the vessel is deteriorating, the agreed CII for the period will be exceeded, then owners shall communicate this in writing to the charters within two working days within receipt of receipt of charter's written plan and then the parties shall cooperate and work together in good faith to agree within two working days thereafter an adjusted written plan for the next voyage or voyages to bring the charter party uh, real time actually attained CII in back up in line with what the parties agreed with the CIO would be for the charter party. And that then there's new, this new plan is deemed to constitute charter's orders, again, baking that agreement 
back into the charter party as both as charters orders. Then it says that until the parties have agreed an adjusted written plan, owners, where they have validly exercised their rights under this subclause G, and that's a, a question that might have to be dealt with in arbitration two years down the line, be entitled to reduce the vessel's speed to bring the charter party attainci back up to what the parties agreed. And worse comes to shove, push come to shove, owners shall be entitled not to follow a charter's orders and or a written plan uh, without being and uh, without themselves owners being in breach of the charter party and with the vessel remaining on hire throughout. And it, then it goes on belt and braces the compliance with charter's orders or the written plan uh, shall not be deemed a breach by owners of the charter party, uh, but but shall be considered as due fulfilment. So the BIMCO guidance uh, notes for this little clause G. Sorry, Tom, it's the previous slide. If you can. Go up again. No, OK, well, the, the BIMCO guidance note described this as a roadmap for the parties to to navigate. It's a real time um, checking in on how the vessel's performing. And it's described as a, um, a roadmap uh, for how parties to, to do this. And I think it's pretty it, it's a quite a brave attempt for the, to, to put in writing the mechanism by which the parties are going to have this real time looking at the speedo, as it were, looking at the performance um, chart to see how the vessel's doing. Um, it is a bit like a ping pong game. You've got two working days, owners to give charters, charters to give owners, owners to give charters, read note. But as I say, it's it's the way of encoding, putting in writing the communication that is probably required. And interestingly, it is a real time exercise. It's not you don't wait till re-delivery and claim and damages. This is what must the parties must do during the charter party if the performance slips. One question I've got is it, 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 it does the this little clause G, this ping pong game of what happens if, if the performance slips, um, states that owners have the, the last word. So if, if an agreed plan, if in a plan, a revised plan, a voyage plan isn't agreed, owners can disregard charters orders and that doesn't constitute a breach. But I'm wondering if that almost puts then the obligation back on owners. So that, does that mean then that owners can't sue charterers if the CII rating slips during the charter party? Because by giving charter owners under little g the power to override charters orders, does that mean with power comes responsibility? Then owners have the responsibility to make sure. So actually, even if charters give orders that are um, are going to mean the ship's not compliant. Owners, by having the power, have the responsibility to override the charter's orders, and therefore perhaps owners won't be able to sue. They won't be able to prove a causation link, or uh, owners won't have done their bit, their duty in overriding charter's orders. I don't know, but this is uh, these are aspects that might come come to play. One option I've thought about if parties are thinking if they want to incorporate the BIMCO clause, if they want to amend it is if you have a plan that means the vessel needs to reduce her speed by say, the parties reckon 20% or owners reckon 20%, perhaps to add skin in the game or perhaps charters say to make it fairer, uh, if the speed is gonna be reduced by 20%, perhaps owners would want to say, well, okay, we'll only we'll give a discount of 20% to the hire. I don't know, this is only my personal view. It's not the club's view or I haven't gained any insight from other people, but it's just, I often find that words in a contract are one thing, but money speaks louder than words often. And actually, if there's skin in the game from both sides, so the owners as the owner of the capital asset wants to maintain the rating and they're obliged to by the regulations, and charter is almost like the tenant of somewhere, they want to employ the vessel. Perhaps if owners you know, give a bit of the, you know, a pro rata reduction of the hire, or perhaps a, a pro rata reduction of the bunker charge, something to make both parties uh, benefit from complying with the regulations. Maybe it's effective, I don't know, but just uh, I throw that in there as an idea. So um, going into during the charter party, performance warranties, um, as I said, we had a question on that. And the BIMCO clause specifically says the charter warranties remain in place. So therefore, the C charters have to comply with CII and owners have the last word on that if they feel that the voyage plan is going to make them their rating slip. But Separately, charters can still uh, sue for, for breach um, of the vessel's performance uh, warranties, the speed and performance warranties. And it's slightly odd 
situation in English law, because usually if a party is in breach or just or had a breakdown, the charters can decide, well, I'm going to claim off hire and or I'm going to claim for breach of, say, the maintenance obligations, and the charters can claim both. But here, the charter express clause overrides that and says, no, no, you still comply with CII, but you can separately sue for the breach of the warranty. So uh, it, to that extent, it, it, it benefits both. Uh, it, it's sort of fairly even handed, you could say, in that regard. Uh, bills of lading. This is a clause we quite often see in BIMCO clauses. So basically, we've got all this clause in a charter party and charters you should also ensure that this clause is uh, included in any bills of lading um, so that therefore it protects owners down the line um, uh, if uh, to make sure that the same obligations apply to owners both under the bills of lading and under the charter party. And the clause goes further, it says not only charters will ensure that the bills of lading include this clause, but also uh, the charter shall indemnify the owners against all consequence and, li and liabilities from um, that arise if the bills of lading don't impose this clause. Uh, and of course, we've all seen the situation, it doesn't necessarily, you might have the clause in the charter and in the bill of lading, it doesn't necessarily mean that receivers are going to pay a blind bit of notice to it if their cargo arrives two weeks later than they thought. Um, but it does, as between the parties, the charter party, uh, provide for what the situation is. And again, um, this is an, a, a, an owner-friendly clause, an indemnity, the owner should be entitled to claim any losses or damages suffered by the vessel, which have been caused by breach of their obligation, charters breach of their obligations under this clause. This is the whole um, CII clause. And the only caveat I got to that, or the only comment I'd make, and uh, I've mentioned before, is that because uh, the parties under the clause have this real-time um, watching brief, as it were, over the performance of the vessel, and they're both responsible for sharing information and monitoring it and perhaps changing the voyage orders, does that mean then that owners, charters would say, well, owners, if it slipped the CIR rating, that's because you owners didn't keep a proper lookout and you didn't override our orders um, to, give an, uh, to give new voyage orders, so actually owners, you can't sue. I don't know, but that's a potential um, uh, an issue that we may see come in play. So next slide, please. So coming to the end of it, as BIMCO says, it's intended to be a standalone clause. It can be incorporated into existing or new charters, and it's intended to provide a reasonable and pragmatic blueprint of how to deal with a new CI regime in practice, and parties are encouraged to consider how it fits with their their shipping, particular trade and, and segment. And I now look, uh, next slide please, what difficulties, I've mentioned some of the ambiguities or the difficulties or nuances perhaps of the clause. Um, and I now just touch on briefly some of the other difficulties the parties may experience or disputes that might arise. So I've mentioned um, the documents that owners need to provide. Um, so this may well be perhaps more detailed than we'd normally get, especially with the real time looking to see the CII rating for the vessel and how it's um, how it's uh, performing. Um, so is this a bigger burden on owners than previously? Will charters get more of front loading of documents and information than they would normally under a time charter? Shall cooperate and work together in good faith? This is an enforceable uh, obligation under English law where it's written expressly into the contract. But again, it's quite hard to see how do you prove a breach of cooperation working together and if you can prove a breach how do you prove what loss as julian has said how can you prove a loss you know what part of that loss was caused because somebody didn't cooperate and how much was loss caused because the vessel didn't maintain or because the bunkers had a low calorific value or whatever else so it's some um, it's needed in the clause um and it is enforceable but it's going to be a, a, an uphill struggle i think to try and pursue a claim based just on that and again, the actionable breach point, um, how do you prove what loss has um, been suffered? Uh, and then there's also the obligation to share findings and best practices that they may identify potential improvements. So I am just wondering, does this mean that there's an implied obligation on both parties, owners and charters, to keep researching ways to improve the energy efficiency? Wouldn't normally be something you'd think of as charters um, realm or sphere of responsibility. Um, but the clause seems to state that both parties have that obligation. And I don't know what, um, how much of an improvement, if you like, how best is best. Um, it's aspirational. I'm not sure how much, 
in practice can be pinned on this clause. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then disputes arising, we've got the little G, I mentioned this ping pong game, um, where, the, where the performance CII starts to slip or deviate. And again, it's, you know, how much must it deviate before it's reasonable for owners to point this out? What evidence will owners need to trigger the clause? Well, the, the clause itself doesn't require any evidence, but later on, if it came into an arbitration, into a dispute, uh, what evidence would owners need? Um, and what happens if it slips, the CI rating slips, but charters think it's due to the vessel deficiency, nothing to do with their bunkers or their orders or anything else. And then what I call the nuclear war, the nuclear option, um, will if charters persist in giving voyage orders that don't comply with a revised plan, the CI rating is slipping, does that mean owners can then say charters, you're not uh, performing the charter party or evincing intention not to perform, uh, that's repudiatory breach, which we accept. On the other hand, does it, because the powers are given to the owners simply to ignore the orders, does that mean owners can't sue for repudiatory breach? Because actually that brings the obligation on owners' shoulders to then override charters' orders and carry on with the ship's operation um, to reduce the CII, uh, to improve the CII rating again. Uh, another, another dispute that might arise or another thing to bear in mind is that the, C the charter party's chain CII excludes fuel consumed and distance traveled during off hire periods. So now um, a couple of things. One, obviously off hire, it's, it becomes even more important to identify the vessels off hire and on hire, not just for the um, whether the hire is due, but all, and not just, you know, can I add the off hire period to the end of the charter, but also if in, you know, between the 1st and 15th of January she's off hire, then the CII, the, the, the CO2 emitted and CII rating in that period shouldn't count towards the charter party CII rating. So therefore, you've got to maintain, you've got to identify which periods don't count for CII as well as for whether hire counts. This also imports an extra obligation on owners who, and this is uh, envisaged in the BIMCO guidance notes, may well then have to have two sets of CII rating calculations. They'll have a, an annual 1st of January to 31st of December CII rating for, for, for IMO in the flag state, and a separate charter party CII rating um, for which will discount off hire periods, you know, with pockets counted out. So they'll have two lots of ratings in real time to keep track of. Uh, and then again, as Julian has um, uh, touched upon already, we've also got the uh, the amount of loss proved. Can you prove a loss? Um, how are you going to deal with it? Um, and you've got, again, you've got the difference between the vessel's earning capacity as, a phys as an asset, a capital asset, which owners will be claiming for and which owners uh, care about. And then you've got the, and the loss of capital value. And then you've got the, the loss of earnings in terms of charter hire, which is off hire or the CI rating um, in terms of performance and, and voyage planning. And then in the market, what experts are there if you do have these disputes? Who is going to be the expert um, to guide the tribunal as to whether there was a breach and, and how to quantify the breach? I mean, you only need to look at things like, I'm just trying to think of, you know, even where the English law landscape is fairly clear as to what uh, the clause requires, there can be, uh, if you look at things like the new Flamenco back in 2014, uh, three three lots of tribunal, high court and court of appeal can disagree with how to apply facts to the law as to whether you uh, include the vessel, the vessel sale value in that case within um, to discount owner's loss. Here, we're applying the facts to an unknown or a new area of law. So it's going to be sort of twice the amount of uncertainty. Um, so just so sort of bear it, bear that in mind. Um, and then next slide, please, Tom. Um, so just some thoughts, as I say, contractually, we're all on a le learning curve. As the BIMCO says themselves, it can no longer mean business as usual for commercial pa parties because the employment orders by charters have a direct and significant impact on the CI regulations. Um, as it were, it is, the CI regulations are themselves interference between the vessel's asset capital assets and its earning capacity, income, chartered employment orders. Um, what amendments are parties making to the BIMCO clauses? I'd be really interested to know. I, mean, I know there's a lot of dissatisfaction or disquiet with, in large segments of the market uh, with the BIMCO clauses, but I don't know what 
better um, terms parties have come up with. Um, as you said, if there's no express clause, then that really is a bit of a, that is a nightmare for owners. Uh, and again, as I've mentioned, what expertise is there uh, in the in the in the market? And commercially, the IMO themselves have said administrations, port authorities, and other stakeholders are encouraged to provide incentives to ships rated A or B. So does this mean, quite apart from the, the headache during the charter parties of CIO ratings, also on a market perspective, uh, will this lead to a hierarchy uh, in the commercial value of ships? Will ports give precedence uh, to berthing queues uh, to ships rated A and B compared to those rated uh, C or below? So these are all commercial aspects um, we've yet to, to see. And then next slide, please. Uh, lastly, um, I think altogether, the end of the day, it's going to be difficult to parties to navigate, but it is up to all parties in the shipping chain to make progress with the CIO regulations. But it's going to be difficult, I think, because it's a regulatory burden until parties can, can align and see the environmental benefits and how they correspond and dovetail with commercial benefits. And here I'd like to... Um, thank Martin Crawford Brunt, who I've been speaking with, his CEO of Lookout Maritime, who some of you might know as the CEO previously of Brightship. As he points out, um, there's a great deal of confusion about what good looks like. Do you comply with the regulations for the sake of the regulations, or, you, or, or is there a dovetailing with that and commercial benefit as well? Especially bearing in mind the regulatory uh, environment is complex already, and the IMO targets for CIA are going to get more and more ambitious and stringent. And at the moment, it's difficult for the parties to assess what the financial return or value will be in exchange for putting financial um, expense into improving the vessel's um, efficiency. I mean, I have to say this uh, with thanks to Ingolf Kaiser at MFB pointed out a trade winds article recently, whereby uh, it was said that um, heavy lift vessels are apparently not uh, uh, subject to the CI regulations. And apparently these are being used uh, to lift uh, containers uh, instead of uh, container feeder ships, um, because then this exempts um, that part of the shipping operation entirely from the CI regulations. That's even though the heavy lift vehicles, heavy lift ve vessels, engines use more fuel, and because they're not designed for containers, the cranes and the holds, it takes longer, and the cranes have to uh, use, use more energy and, and expel more CO2, than if uh, a designed feeder vessel is used. So again, that's a, as an example, that's what good does not look like, um, but there will always be a temptation for parties to try and get around the regulations, unless and until it benefits them, I think, in financial terms, as well as the, the environmental um, uh, side of things. Um, two initiatives I, I know, um, or I've been um, looked at briefly, and also for information for operators is the Baltic Exchange, um, so they've done some voyage benchmarking and they're updating their website at the moment in a consultation with the industry. And the voyage benchmark, which is based both on the EEOI and the CII, um, which benchmarks typical routes and types of uh, ship to understand what the CII rating would be for those routes and types of ships. So you can actually see the operating efficiencies of the vessels and what likely CII outcome is for each type of uh, voyage and vessel. Uh, there's also the um, Blue Visby Consortium. Uh, I think as Simon mentioned earlier on, um, using it, uh, this is to, to stop the sail fast and then wait conundrum. So it's for a joined up approach. So if you're looking at a car analogy, there's no point in zooming towards a, a, a roadworks then to stop still and go again. So it's, it's, um, it's a, a system where tar vessels will be given target ETAs by the port, the discharge port, to ensure that the number of vessels are anchored in a way is in, in a sort of managed queue um, in advance so that ships know before they arrive when to arrive and they don't need to, to, to sail fast and then sit there. And uh, the, it's perceived, it's uh, envisaged that this alone, the sort of joined up approach or ticketing approach rather than sailing fast and wait, this initiative alone would save between 10 and 15% of carbon emissions per voyage just by optimizing the speed and the, and the, the dovetailing, making it joined up approach in the voyage. So that again is something that doesn't require 
um, uh, extra modification to the vessel. It's not it's not uh, difficult for the, uh, the parties to navigate in terms of contractually, but it's just a pragmatic, physical way to reduce the emissions um, by this joined up approach that needs the terminals and the, and the ports um, to contribute um, with that. Um, and Lookout Maritime is um, initiating, uh, is, it, is a steering group and initiating again feedback from the in industry, is asking for feedback from the industry and engagement to see if we can get some more traction with that. So I think that's the end of my um, talks. Um, and I think I'm going to then hand over to Suzanne in case um, there are any questions. Uh, thank uh, you very much. Unfortunately, oh, Suzanne is back. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes, I just want to uh, to thank you, Nicola and Julian and Simon for your presentations. Um, much appreciated. We would normally take some questions now, but we're actually well over the hour. I think some of these questions have been answered by Nicola, at least in part. And what we'll do is we've taken a note of the questions. We will get back to you on email. So at least you will have some uh, answers in due course. For those of you who'd like a copy of the presentation, you've already asked for that, and we will certainly make that available to you. It just uh, leaves me now to thank our speakers once again, and also to thank you, our participants, for your attendance. Uh, this has been quite a lot of information on a very hot topic, and we hope you've enjoyed it. So good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Good night. Thanks, all.